Well, welcome everybody to HydroTerra's Tech Talk series. So this is um, exciting for HydroTerra. It's a bit different to our standard webinar series. This one's very much more technology focused and really appreciate Centec for um, providing a true expert in the area of soil moisture monitoring. So the Tech Talk today is titled Exploring Soil Moisture Products, Applications and Emerging Technology Innovations. Our presenters today, yeah. Mehdi Zaboli, who's Regional Manager for Centec in Australia and New Zealand and the Middle East, I think it's him. Um, myself, Managing Director of HydroTerra, and Ruben Anderson, who's an environmental scientist with HydroTerra, who's doing a lot of work with soil moisture technologies, including running several projects, which we will be covering in some case studies today. Before we charge into things, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners of the land. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Bunawarung people of the Kulin Nation where we are located today. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Here's a picture of our speakers, Reuben a few years ago, I think. It uh, hasn't changed look that much. And there's Mehdi on the right. A little bit about Mehdi. Uh, he was born in the highlands of northern Iran in a farming family. He studied agricultural science and worked as an agriculture extension and field technician until migrating to Australia in 2003. He's continued his study at Adelaide University, did a master's in plant breeding and land management, then started working at the Agriculture Department of South Australia as an extension research officer in the Mallee of South Australia and Victoria. Then started slash finished his MBA at the University of South Australia, then engaged in agriculture business training and capacity building projects in developing countries throughout Asia, the Middle East and Africa for a few years. And he started working at Centec in 2019 Based, which is based in Adelaide. Medi currently looks after Australian New Zealand customers and clients for Centec and is the regional manager in Australia New Zealand region for Centec. Medi runs his hobby pomegranate fruits farm in Adelaide Hills with his wife and is a very keen fisherman. Some of Medi's interests, ag tech, gardening, meditation, fishing, camping, travelling, soccer, sustainable food production, carbon farming, mental health, equality, and bushwalking. Clearly a deep thinker. Before we charge into things, we love your questions. And in order for us to answer them, you need to log them into the Q&A section of our website. Uh, sorry on this Zoom call. So I will then read out those questions at the end and um, go through those. We'll do our best to answer them. So why has HydroTerra started up these tech talks? Well, we do various roadshows with suppliers and on the last roadshow we did with Solenst at the end of last year, there was real uh, desire from the people we were meeting with to have a forum for learning more about technology and equipment. And so we thought this would be a good complementary series to the webinars we've been running, which are more about the application of the sort of measurements and how we can use that to help manage things. This one's got more of a technology focus. It still deals with some of the applications but it's a sort of technology category 
centric um, type presentation. We're very lucky to have some great suppliers and those suppliers have a lot of technical knowledge. And of course, they know more than anyone about their particular technology in terms of how it works and the theory behind it. So we're really lucky to have people to present on these things. So Medi today, really appreciate your help there. I forgot to introduce Ruben. Ruben uh, has been working at Hydroterra for, I think, how long, Ruben? Three years? Um, and uh, comes with a background in environmental science. He's been doing a great job working on a range of projects with us and has a lot of experience with the installation side of some of the technologies that we're looking at today, as well as the data analysis that comes with those technologies. So we'll be going through some of those case studies today. Mehdi, just be careful that you're unmuted and Ruben as well. Um, so without further ado, uh, just a little bit about our relationship um, between ourselves and Centec. So Hydroterra is a distributor for Centec, which means we take responsibility for recommending suitable technologies for monitoring needs. So you may have a specific need and we may choose to introduce one of the Centec products into the solution. We are insured for that advice, which puts us in a fairly unique position in the market. So um, not many of the equipment providers have professional indemnity insurance. We've decided in order to be able to provide advice and provide advice in writing um, with respect to monitoring system design that we needed professional indemnity insurance. We've been working with Centec for approximately 18 years. So a lot longer than Medi's been working with Centec actually. But um, the very first, one of the very first projects we did was a Mali research project looking at soil moisture movement uh, in a desert, semi-desert environment. And uh, they were very helpful. And um, since then, we've had a, a productive relationship. They refer us various leads to assist on projects. So our role as a distributor is to provide uh, advice on when to use the technology, to facilitate the procurement side of things for that, but also importantly to provide advice on how you can use that data with how you're managing your sites. So we have an installation team at Hydroterra that uh, regularly installs these types of probes and uh, a lot of experience integrating these into other systems as well. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to Mehdi. Um, thanks Richard for introduction and uh, also thanks to Team Hydroterra for uh, coordinating and organizing this tech talk. Um, and thanks for having me. Also, thanks to all of the audience and their attention for the next um, half an hour, 45 minutes, where we spend uh, a little bit of time on, on the various projects um, that is running and also some of the equipments in the in the market that we are supplying. Um, um, as Richard said, my name is Mehdi. I look after um, our accounts and, and the customers um, in Australia and New Zealand uh, for Centec. And yeah, I've been in that position for um, about three years um, up until now. Okay. Um, in terms of, I could jump in straight into uh, the um, the areas that uh, we cover. Uh, so very briefly, and then uh, we get into uh, some of the technical uh, details. So in terms of what uh, we do, uh, Centec uh, normally um, uh, it's mainly is uh, servicing uh, four main uh, industries or uh, industry partners and in, in this regard landscape agriculture research and environment as you can see and i've highlighted uh, some of those uh, areas in red uh, so they're intentional so there would be uh, some of the topics that we will be covering today in terms of uh, some of the case studies and projects that we've been involved um, and we actually supplied the equipments we don't deliver the the, the projects so we are only manufacturer and we supply the equipments to um, an authorized distributors such as uh, hydroterra 
uh, that uh, can handle uh, the scientific as well as the technical grade of, of the equipments as well as the, the scale of the projects. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, uh, Richard. Yep. So again, so Centric been around since 1991. Um, a few years before then, and they were start establishing uh, the, the 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 probes and and the sensor equipments. And uh, since then, uh, they have uh, Centric has been um, developing and and manufacturing uh, the, the hardware as well as the software and all of the spare parts, anything that related to the equipments uh, from Adelaide, South Australia. Uh, it's an Australian-based company and Australian-owned company and uh, supplying at the moment to around 80 countries globally and uh, through 650 distributors, uh, authorized distributors across the globe. Now, in terms of the probes and, and the sensors that we manufacture, so they mainly falling into two different categories. And uh, both of these categories of the probes are used in, in the case studies that we will be discussing uh, later. So as a, like a very generic um, kind of like a categorizing the probes, um, so they are either in wire scan, which is the one on the right-hand side of the screen, which is the original uh, design of, of the probes um, and um, the, the second, uh, or the, the, the other family of the probes are a drill and drop, which is the one on the left hand side of the screen. And uh, so these guys are more of a commercialized version of the Enviroscan or the original uh, probe. So it would be easier for installation extractions of, of the equipments for uh, for a commercial products and, and for, sorry, for a commercial production of the food, mainly in the agriculture and food production industry. And the middle one is just one of the types of the uh, drill and drop, which has Bluetooth. Uh, so, um, and that's, you can see in the middle of that. So as, as you can see, so they are all made in uh, Australia, made in Adelaide, and uh, we are proud to be South Australian manufacturer. And uh, there has been a quite significant number of the, the awards that Ascentic uh, uh, obtained and acquired since the uh, start of the um, data when we came to the market. Now, in terms of the, the products and the, the length of the products, so there are different range of the products or length that you know we supply. So they're starting from 10 centimeter going to 10, 30, 60, 90, 120, 150. So they are in terms of the, um, the drill and drop family or the, the one under the left hand side of the um, screen. Uh, but again, in terms of the Inwara scans, so they're, um, um, they're flexible and tailor made. So we um, do um, from anywhere from 50, centi 50 centimeters, and that can go down to um, any length of, of the required for the projects. So normally we've um, done anywhere between 10, 20 to 30 meters. So it hasn't been anything longer than that, but there is no any restriction in terms of how deep they can go. Um, now, in terms of, um, I would move on to the, the telemetry devices as well as the, the new products that uh, we are releasing in the market. So the um, the products that you can see right in the middle of the, the screen. So uh, this one is a new product that uh, we have released last year, which is the new IoT DTU, we call it, so IoT logger or a data transfer unit. DTU. So that uh, unit is capable of connecting to 2G, 3G, 4G, NextG, CATM1, and NB-IoT. And also there are uh, Bluetooth chips, Wi-Fi chips, and LoRaWAN radio chips in there as well. But it doesn't mean that all of them are active at the same time. So there are uh, capacities that built into that uh, product for, uh, to be compatible with the future products that we are uh, about to release in, in, in the coming months or years. Uh, so there are a fair few um, products that there will be connecting to Wi-Fi as well as the radio uh, systems um, that are in the pipeline. Some of them very close to be released. Some of them are slightly further away. But again, we're talking about next 12 to 24 months. Uh, some of these products will be released to the market and there would be a revolution. Um, now, um, in terms of, uh, again, so the, the, the middle parts or, or the, the IoT DTU. So again, so that that little connection uh, or DTU can also connect to uh, Bluetooth devices that the, the, the probe that we had in the previous slide in the middle of the page. So the, the Bluetooth uh, probes, they can connect to this uh, hub. So in that case, if the, the Bluetooth is activated and in that hub and then all the information that come through, that will be transferred to um, the, the uh, user's account uh, via the, the cellular network. 
or if they have a radio or a Wi-Fi and, and mesh around the, the, the farm or the from the, the site where it's uh, um, operating, then uh, we'll be sending through that. So no need for um, a data subscription and the SIM cards. Um, so below that page also, there are other older types of the telemetries that uh, we used to manufacture and we still manufacture as uh, some of them and they are still selling and they have a place in the market. But I won't spend too much time on those ones. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So this one is, uh, would be a quick one. So Solio Sampler, one of the um, the hidden gems uh, that uh, has been in, um, and we have been providing to the markets for quite some time. Uh, so these uh, products are meant to be either for the temporary or or a, or a more permanent base uh, installed in, in the ground at the different depths. Um, so they would be um, different uh, categories or different types of the solute samplers for a water sampling. Um, so that would be for a low flow or a high flow, which is different for um, um, lighter soil, sandy soil, or a heavier clay soil. So again, so there are different flow rates. So there would be a, a more a, a, a suitable products depending on what type of a soil they have. Um, so they we have tested them. So down to about six meters, you still can extract the the, the water sample from from the reservoir. But anything more than that, we haven't really done any um, like a proper research or a trial on it so we can't uh, comfortably say that but that holds about about 30 to 35 mil of of a water sample at the depths of your requirements of the projects and uh, they are being used quite extensively especially in the research settings with the universities and r d institutes and uh, some of the environmental monitoring projects that um, uh, the samples are important for for a lab tests um, so if you can go to the next um, slide, please, we, Richard. Just yep. before we do, so the audience, um, so these are really good in the unsaturated zone, so above your water table, and they provide a really good complementary data set. So um, where we've often seen these used is on effluent irrigation sites, for example, um, and when you're looking at fertilizer loads that might be moving down through the soil profile, um, you can use these and they produce a beautifully clear sample because the water goes in through that ceramic and by the time it's flowed through the ceramic, it's crystal clear. So we have used them quite a lot. They're, they're very good and easy to install. Um, so that's a uh, solute sampler is actually is a good companion for the Invara scan products and also the, the deep probes, uh, which are like uh, normally when we call them deep probe, they're starting from three meters and more. And in, in that case, then the, the type of the um, access tube or the tube that installed before the sensor rods goes inside. So it is quite thicker uh, for, um, we call them mining tubes. Uh, but again, so they are mainly for, for a deep installation down to 10, 20, 30 meters if need be because of the, all of the pressure from, from the soil down deep. Uh, so it doesn't crush the, the access tube and uh, avoid any water intrusion into, into the sensor area where um, we need to read. Um, as I normally, solute samplers and the way that it's installed so again so deep probes goes in and then solute samplers somewhere around, around half a meter one meter but not too far away from from the probes are installed uh, on a permanent basis almost and then okay, the, the scientist or the technician can go exactly to the same side and then get the sample exactly from the same side which is an apple for apple comparison rather than taking a sample from one depth and another depth and somewhere else and also i have seen some of the products that uh, hydroterra also supply and they're quite extensive and the the product i think was like an english brand um, um a water sampling that ruben had um, in the water association conference uh, last year which was quite extensive as well but um and so this is a like lighter version of 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 that product so for a for like just purely for a sampling of the water uh soil water content um from that specific depths um, and, and that has been case studies on those ones. So again, the way that it's been used, uh, the way that I've uh, described is also been used and in, in a number of different uh, projects um, in, in various countries and regions. So um, as you can see on the left-hand side, so there's the sensors are slightly different, so slightly smaller. So because the, the access tube is quite thicker, so it needs to be um, uh, fitting inside the tubes. And also everything is, is pretty much um, heavy duty when it comes to a long probe, so to be able to handle extra pressures 
uh, down in in the in the soil profile when you go down to 10 20 30 meters then you would need that sort of like a robustness of the the products and in terms of the the, the parameters or the factors or the the top of the sensors that can be used inside those long uh, tubes uh, or deep probes are again so you can measure again this exact same as any other commercial products like a moisture temperature and the salinity or a volumetric ionic content which is a total kind of a value of of a total ions uh, um, in in the solutes or, or the, the solution of the soil um in the water content um if you can go to the next slide please richard yeah just a uh, comment that this is one of the big differentiators that Centec has is this ability to create very long mm. sets of probe pro broad lengths yeah, as long as far as I'm concerned, there is no any other uh, supplier in the market that can do that type type of a uh, um, long probes for a project. And uh, I think we are the the only one in the world that supply that one. But um, um, yeah, so let's move on. Now, um, one of the new functions that you now I'm moving quickly to the, the software. So get to the new products and, and new services that I'm, I'm 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 talking at the moment, and then we move on to the case study. So this one, what you can see is just a quick uh, screenshot of the Irimax Live uh, software, which is the display and analysis dashboard for Centec products, and that's where we send our data in if um, they're using our loggers. So the information come to this uh, software. So what you can see here, so there are some green uh, bands that coming from the top as well as some green bands coming from the bottom so the, the top one again any sort of like irrigation or rainfall events that detect those ones again we also have another function built into the software that detects root activities for uh, for a cropping situations and food production as well as for any other um, um, applications that require and knowing that where is the the wetting front or where the water coming from is it from top from a bottom or from lateral movements of the water so again the top one is a common one that we normally see of obviously irrigation and rainfall come through and then shows that how far did the water is going and then also you can go down to a minute if you need to 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 um, calculate exact uh, the scale or the amount of the water that has been um, um, infiltrating into the soil profile. But actually, the, the, the bottom one uh, is, is a new um, function that we built into Airmax that we haven't released yet. But again, I guess, I guess uh, publicly, this is the first place we are talking about it um, in this tech talk. So mainly in, in the areas that close to um, um, a big uh, water uh, bodies, let's say ocean or, or lakes, uh, where there is a fluctuation in the water table. So we see um, a bit of a water table movements and a rising and that causing some um, issues for a constructions for a, for a cropping situations for for a landscaping and the movement of the soil and this function is, is actually good uh, function that I uh, can use that one to detect where it's coming and if there is any any um, water or, uh, water table rising happening so you can set the alarm uh, so you can get the alerts and uh, then make a managerial decision or adjust the, the scheduling or whatever decision need to be made for that site for um, um, for requirements of your projects now if you can uh, move on to the next one uh, next slide please so um, on this slide, uh, we will just, uh, touch base on, on this slide as well, but there are a number of the satellite imageries um, available uh, from, from this uh, platform, from the Irmax live as well, so which is an like, add-on service to um, the, the soil data probes as well as the weather station. So you can get this type of like a five different types of imageries. Um, as uh, you can see, so NDMI, RDRE, NDVI, MSAVI, and RCI, every one of them has got a different uh, functions and uh, they're uh, fairly um, uh, cheap in terms of accessing them. Uh, I've been added to Airmax, uh, I think for uh, I think we've been we've had it for a good couple of years, uh, but again, number of the what the supplier has changed, also the resolution has changed, and uh, also the the availability of of the the imageries also uh, change as well. Because again, depending of where um, um you are in the world, depending how um how is the the cloud coverage over the area, then there might be a limitation to get the the satellite imageries. But uh, this supplier seems to be very good, and this um, and the clients are happy with the service so um again from the top you can see the what exactly every single one of those ones means in terms of the, the moisture index in terms of red edge uh, chlorophyll index in terms of uh, vegetation index in terms of bare soil 
or um, or a com combination of the bare soil with the vegeta vegetation and different layers give you a different kind of like a views and and overviews uh, so it would be very beneficial for um, um like overlooking over the entire area and then if there are any specific areas that shows some sort of a, um and different um uh, values or different data then that would be easier to look up from the top and then go exactly to the point and then try to work out what needs to be done in that certain area or at least adds a different perspective to to the view to the data uh, that coming from from the soil data probes and the other um, sensors that you might have uh, for the site we will touch base on that one but uh, for now i think we can move on is that uh, daily data, Mehdi, or? So that data, very good question, by the way, Richard. So we um, have the, the commitment of at least three uh, photos per week will be supplied. Uh, the data the database, can you uh, the clients, once they, they signed up, so they can actually buy back, go back to two years ago. So it's not just from today, you get you signing up for these databases, so you get it from today, you can go back just in case for like um, and getting to the history of the block. So let's say you purchased a new block recently, but you want to know what was going on in the, in the past. At least this function gives you some information and data uh, about that specific property or, or a site. Um, and also that will um, a minimum of three uh, per week uh, can be supplied as long as we have 10% or lower uh, cloud coverage. You can ma maximize the, sorry, minimize the, the, the quality of the photos by increasing the, the, the cloud coverage. Let's say you can, you are happy to get 50%. Uh, if, if the, if there are 50% cloud coverage on the area, you're happy still to get the photos, but there might be some patches because of the cloud that is covering up and is not clear, but again, it's entirely up to the clients how they want to go ahead. And I highly recommend to any um, um, any professional and technician in this game. So having a different view towards the sites um, from, from the satellite imagery is, is quite helpful. So next one, um, we have like a 2D uh, lateral movement of, of the water movement. So for this, uh, this is uh, one of the functions that has been in the Airmax for a while, but recently we've seen an, a quite increased number of the usage. Of, of this function as mainly that used for analysis of the back. You, first of all, sorry, go a couple of steps back. You need at least two probes. So they are within 20 to 30 meters from each other, 20 to 30 centimeters from each other. So again, that's comparison of the data would be um, a valid a point of a, um, 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 a comparison. Then as you can see on the left hand side, so um, and there is a green band, blue band and and, and the red band. So they are looking, uh, they, they shows different uh, contents of the moisture in the soil. But on the side of that left hand side, so you see number of the sensors from top to bottom. So that's like kind of like a visualizing how the sensor is laid out uh, or the probes is laid out. And then the water movement between the sensors, you can actually make the 2D uh, video um, and and the imagery of it um, for for uh, being easier on on, on the, the presentations. Um, that's also available on the software. Um, so if you can move on, unless there's a question. If it's, if, if your spacing is bigger than that, can you still use the visualization? You can, you can use the, the like if one probe from one side of the town, one probe from the other side of the town, but data wouldn't be. Uh, um, a, a true reflection of what's going on. So there's, there's no correlation. So you need probes to be close to each other. So again, the data talk to each other. And so you can see the, the real movements of the water. But if it's too far away, I would not um, use that or, or, or recommend it. Uh, now, um, in terms of uh, this slides, it's, that's covering up my title. Let's say if I, who can see this? Ah, yeah. Okay. So this is on the left hand side of this pane. Again, so one of the functions that um, I would say probably underutilized, but will be very, very useful in terms of the environmental monitoring as well as the food production, uh, especially tracking fertilizers in the soil and, and the leaching of the fertilizer and the chemicals in the soil. So on the left hand side of the uh, this um, graph, you can see that something that I've, I've 
put it like a, a red circle around it, says VIC or VIC, which is the volumetric ionic content or uh, um, in, in, in the short, it would be um, a nutrients or, or the ions diluted in the, in the soil uh, uh, water content and solute. And once they're in the water, that's, so they're readily available to the roots of the crops or um, to, for a sensor to pick up their, those um, signals, then they will be picked up. So um, where it's, the applications are, and so again, so I'm not going to talk about the, the, the food production. So mainly we are focusing on, on the environmental uh, product, uh, projects and the monitoring projects. So in this case, so you can set up um, a, a certain thresholds um, for again, where you get like at the top of that uh, limit or the threshold when you need to know what's going on. So again, so that's alert for a high readings of, of the ionic content activity in the soil or or um, movements of the ions in the soil from various layers, top to bottom or bottom to top, depending how the water is moving in that uh, specific location. And also, so once you set up the alert, so again, so you will get a notification once um, the budget line or or, or that alert uh, is been uh, met or um, um, so the number's gone or hit that that target, then you will get an alert. So, you know, it's the early warning kind of like situations uh, rather than you go and check every single probe and the readings and analyzing it every single time. So it makes it easier for, for the scientists and technicians and the and, and R&D team to work on the data and get to the points uh, very quickly rather than and going and checking every single one of those um, uh, probes and, and the data points. Um, so as you can see, again, on the right-hand side of the um, uh, graph, so there are two other uh, circles. So it, that's quite a small print, but again, so you can change the name to whatever you want. So I, I personally just change it, uh, change it to leech alert high, and then the bottom one, leech alert low. So just to make it a bit more, make it sense for, for this presentation, but that, that name or, wh or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, that's up entirely up to the the operator so and normally the application that uh, this uh, function can be used is in uh, water contamination detection uh, landfill le leach monitoring which we will cover up later down the track uh, and agricultural food production in terms of fertilizer tracking, how much fertilizer getting out of the soil or in, in the lower uh, profile of the soil in the water table, um, and as well as the land rehabilitation for a mining site. Again, we will be covering on that one and uh, the EPA projects uh, across the country. Um, now, if we can move on to the next one, please. What's the, um, on the moisture content on that left-hand vertical axis? Uh, on on this units on, of measure there, uh, ppm's part per millions, but that's accumulation of um, of of the the sensor, certain top of a sensor. So let's say again, in this case, we have. 80, 100, 10, 130. So this was one and a half meter uh, probe, uh, um, including I believe seven or eight different sensors at a different depths. And I only picked up like just again, just for the sake of this uh, presentation. So again, on the top layer of the soil, I wouldn't be interested in what the ionic activities are going on, but in the, the bottom three. So I would be more interested just in case if there is any water table rising and bringing some more uh, uh, ionic uh, um, um, into the, the upper li uh, layers. So I set up all those ones. So in this case, I can see um, the depths of 80, 110, and 130 we picked up and then summarized in, in one uh, summary graph, which you can see um, in on that uh, screen. So you, you can make a summary of only one of the sensors. So you get alert based on the one sensor reading. So let's say your top layer is more important to you. So you can set up this alert based on the top, top layers or the second or three or all of them together. But normally in terms of the, the analysis and R&D, they're more specifically interested in the certain horizons uh, of the soil once the, the numbers hitting uh, above or below thresholds, and then they start uh, doing different investigation on the sites. So in this case, uh, Richard, so that number is the accumulation of the three sensors. So those three sensors and those numbers that you can see on the left and right hand side of the the the, uh, the graph, they are three sensors reading combined together. Okay, thank you. 
Um, next one, almost uh, exactly the same thing, but rather than concentrating on the, the volumetric ion content and the alert in the soil, this is based purely on the water content in the soil. So on the left-hand side of the uh, this graph, uh, you can see, again, the red circle that's in a fine print called soil water content, and that's per, presented as a millimeter. Um, 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 and also it can be interpreted or read as a percentage in, in the soil. So let's say um, on the, what well, this is the, the uh, summarized or the accumulation of one, two, three, four, five, six sensors. So from 10, 30, 50, 80, and 110 centimeter sensors. So that has been summarized and then put into one graph. Um, so um, that numbers on the left and right, so they wouldn't be a good representative for a millimeter or, or a percentage in this case. But if you're looking at only one specific sensor, so that would be a better uh, representation for, um, for the sensor readings. Um, by the way, um, the, the readings and the numbers are, uh, the, the probes are scientific grade probes, rather um, including both drill drop and, and the Nivara scan. And uh, later down in, in, the, in the presentation and when um, the, the copy of the presentation, if uh, getting shared by the clients, so all of the references um, and, and the um, publication that has been done on, on the calibration, as well as on the case studies available that uh, Team Hydroterra will uh, supply for our uh, uh, respected audience. Um, now, in this case, um, so we just quickly uh, touch base on what it is, when, how, what's the application looks like in in the um, environmental um, um, monitoring projects. So, let's say um, an increase or decrease of the certain uh, water content in in the soil layers in in, in certain areas of interest for. Um, for um, a um, government body or research body or, or for a client, uh, then in this case, uh, so you can set up uh, and the, the alerts uh, for a high threshold, low threshold, and, and only picked up two. So in this case, like the, the top right uh, corner where they have the circle, the fine print or the title of that one, I just call it saturation. Uh, so that's the full saturation. So preferably you don't want to go above the saturation unless you intentionally try to wash down some sort of like a, um, ions in the soil in the lower uh, profiles of the soil or horizon of the soil. But uh, in general, uh, so saturation is somewhere that it's if you want, you can set the, like a ticket on in your in the settings of the back end of the software. So you can get the alert once it hits the, any of those budget lines. So we as I said, I've just put two of those saturation and, and the refill point, um, refill. But again, so there are three other factors that you can build in, and then you can get the alert based, alerts based on those budget lines or by, based on those uh, in, uh, points of interest. Then you can do further investigations on, on, on those ones. So applications, uh, very, very um, extensive application of this uh, uh, function is mainly for uh, flood forecast. Uh, so it has been used in a number of different projects in a number of different uh, countries at the moment. And uh, normally the way that they do it, so they, they have a higher uh, threshold or, or the saturation threshold for uh, when the soil getting closer to the saturation point. Preferably you don't want to get that part. But again, if it's a rainfall situation, you don't really have a choice of controlling the, the, the volume of the water is entering into the soil horizon. So in that case, at least you know that you are getting closer to, to, the, to the stage that could possibly... Uh, cause a flood or a, or a surface water runoff. And again, depending on the volume, then there would be different management strategies. So that was one of the applications, surface water management. Again, so that's one of the case studies, the studies that we will talk in today. So how come and how, how can you push the system uh, to the max without uh, disturbing the system and without causing other natural uh, disasters like a flood by, by doing this? Definitely huge potential in agriculture as well as uh, in the water licensing uh, authorities. Uh, for example, let's say in, in New Zealand, um, so they use these reports that coming from, from a different display software, including our software, to renew the water licenses for, for the uh, food productions and, and for the different license holders of, of the agriculture and, uh, and the food production or a non-food production sectors. So that water license, they, they need to uh, kind of like a show how the, the water is being used, how much evapotranspirated, how much used by the crops, how much leached down. And again, so these uh, databases and these display dashboards will give you lo lots of different uh, options in terms of how you can report back to the council. And if they need to have access direct to the back end of the, the databases, it's also available from the software, which we will cover up later down the track. 
if there is, is Australia any um, doing that having the same there are there things? are there are trials in the two states. I can't be too specific because it's still a, um, a confidential project that uh, um, we were supplying hardware. But uh, that's, that's definitely that's something that Australian government, uh, at least two states, are looking into it. And uh, then they will be adjusting the water licensing based on those uh, values and the reports that they're getting from their own probes. And then mom normally those probes would be like longer probes, two, three, four meters deep. Um, and they're getting a quite uh, nice values and they're strategically positioned in a certain areas of the, of the catchments or, or uh, residential areas or, or uh, the watersheds or in the, in the agricultural areas uh, where they need to um, uh, work around um, what sort of a volume of the water is actually leaching down and what is uh, getting transferred from the ag chemicals and from the surface into the, the groundwater. Hmm. Now, um, if there is no question, we can move on to the next. Now, we have got a couple of questions that have come up. I'm just wondering in this sort of format if we should maybe look at them more regularly because um, they'll be quite specific. Um, all right. So Ross McFarland says, what are the units for VIC? PPM. PPM. Part, per, part yeah. per million, yeah. And... Uh, then he said milligrams per litre dissolved solids was the other question he was asking. Um, depending what sort of like a um, uh, measurement they're doing, is it based on the one sensor or based on the accumulation of the sensor? Accumulation of the sensor is not um, um, a good way to look at it because, uh, again, so that gets it out of the proportion of how it's been formulated and calculated. But um, the actual um, single sensors, uh, they are more uh, um, aligned with and um, closer to, to the reality, what the, the numbers that you will be getting from, from, from the water samples that getting sent to the lab. And the best way actually looking into it, so again, look at it as a, to start with as a, as a trend, um, 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 a trend of the, the, the volumetric ionic uh, content in the soil and based on the, the, the numbers or the results that you're getting from the water sample that got sent to the, to the lab, then you can adjust the, the, the calibration based on the soil top. So again, there are various soil tops. There would be different tops of, of different uh, readings in the different soil tops. And uh, the readings, if it's just based on the generic calibration that you mean applied to the readings, then again, the sandy soil is going to be very, very different from, from the clay soil. And the, the, the missing link or, or the... Um, uh, the link that will assist in that situation in terms of getting a proper numbers and scientific grade numbers is to compare the, the lab test results uh, from water samples from, let's say, from solute samplers or any other ways that you know, they collect the samples and then compare the data with the readings from, from the, the VIC sensor in our probes. Um, now, start case studies. So again, in terms of uh, uh, we're concentrating on some of the long probes and some of the, the project that has been associated with that and how there's been used and uh, uh, the, the strategies that have been put in place. So first one uh, was in the landslide in Brazil. Uh, on top of my head, I think it was 2005 when it happened. And then they started looking into why it happened. And as you can see on the down bottom uh, left corner of the page where it says talking about the soil uh, stratum one, two, and three. So uh, the, the orange uh, layer of the soil in that specific area um, is, is prone to get saturated and get heavier and causing a slide for, for a stratum one, which is the top soil. Um, in, in that specific case, that the top stratum was somewhere close to about 15 meters. And uh, what they have used, maximum of the 30 meter in virus can probe was used, but there are in some other cases that at, on the same site, by the way, so it was so maybe 15 and 20 meters as well, um, depending uh, what the soil top was, because again, you don't really want to go into the rocks because uh, it's the, the readings or the, the medium that the sensors are reading meant to be soil, not water, not rocks. And the, the, the values wouldn't be making any sense. But in some cases, especially in the mining cases, um, you would actually need to go and drill into the rocks to see that if there is any water penetration into that layer for their purposes. So in this case, um, so there was a, 
uh, um, uh, massive uh, um, uh, infrastructure issue and, and damage because of the landslide. What they have done, a number of the um, wire scan probes, uh, long probes being used uh, strategically in, in certain locations. In that middle of uh, the, the slide, so you can see like a, land, a huge, big, like a screenshot, of, not a screenshot, a, um, a shot of, of the landscape down in the valley. And right there, this is not very clear, but that's top of the one of the sensors with, with the solar panel uh, that is sticking out. So there were a number of them on the very, very deep slopes uh, were planted or were installed. Uh, where uh, there were higher uh, chances or the prone uh, to, to to the landslide, and now they are they have been uh, checking those um, 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 values and, and those probes on on a very um, regular basis. And of course, I believe they have some sort of like a alert system for it. But these systems are not downloading or uploading information into the the Airmax Live, so won't have access. And uh, so this is going to the, the local server, and that's another capacity of the software. So you can have the software at the desktop level for a data security, let's say airports, like army bases, some of the places of high interest. So normally that's what they do. So they have the Irimax desktop version, which they hold all the information at the at the local server level, so not in the cloud. But again, um, what the, our best seller and, and what majority of the users our details are using are the Irimax Live, which they can have access from anywhere in the world, as long as they have their username password. So, um, so um, um, th then uh, you can see on the right hand side of that uh, um, a page, um, it was a huge and massive um, damage to the railway as well as to the actual highway on, on the top uh, left corner as well. So you can see um, the huge sites and that's damage. Also, there was some uh, human lives uh, lost in that project. So um, that site since then has been uh, um, monitored and, uh, and we can move on to the next slide quickly. If if there is no question yet. It looks like a very lucky train, I have to say. Oh, yes. <laughs> Ordinary stayed on the tracks. Um, okay. That was a $19 billion project uh, that was damaged because of that um, uh, lands landslide. Yep. Um, sorry, I've just got to get it to move to the next slide. It's There we go. Right, yo. So next one, Great Barrier Reef uh, watch and, and the monitoring project. Um, so as uh, we, most of us, at least in Australia, were aware of it. So there are uh, um, concern for the Great Barrier Reef health um, and, and the reef health and the fauna and flora that's going on down there. So for that reason, Australian government putting and injecting money through different grants, through different NGOs or, non or government agencies and through different local authorities and associations. So to monitor the, the leaching uh, uh, of of the uh, unwanted um, um, uh, contaminant in the soil as well as the the chemicals in the soil. So uh, of course the area is is a very fertile area and has been extensively um, farmed. Um, so in that specific case, like one of the projects, so we're talking about somewhere close to about sixty sites uh, on the in the top left corner, and then and in one of the sites that has got a bit of a more probes and and more uh, soil data probes, so like is zoomed in and. That, that in that location so you can when, once you zoom in then the number of the probes will be popping everywhere otherwise they show that like the, this location 10 probes on that location five probes right. and so on but anyway what they're trying to do here in that catchment area uh, so they um, installed a number of uh, our uh, probes um, so again they are the tri-scan probes and I should have explained it earlier on so the probes can come in two different forms so depending on the top of the sensor that has been used inside the, the access tubes or the probes so we call them dual scan or a tri scan dual scan does the moisture and temperature at every 10 centimeter um, and tri scan does uh, again at every 10 centimeter gaps you can go down to 20 30 40 meters if you need to uh, and the different locations uh, you can get tri scans which is the moisture temperature as well as uh, salinity or the volumetric ionic contents in the soil on that specific site. So they are not correlating to each other. So they are not averaging out based on, um, like let's say the top five sensors giving you this. No, you get the 
pr proper values from every depth that you have uh, used the sensors, and then um, uh, you can uh, start doing the the management and the strategies around those numbers and uh, adjust the the irrigation, fertigation, or or uh, um, site managements uh, depending what uh, the project is trying to achieve. Now, in in this case, um, so we have used the only compact uh, packages. Um, we call them compact, so the the one on the, the, the equipment on the right hand side. So 120 centimeter tri scan probes uh, connected to a compact uh, data transfer unit or a DTU or a logger. And they are sending information on every half an hour uh, intervals uh, at every one of those 10 centimeters. So 12 sensors all the way, getting all the values for temperature, moisture, as well as the uh, nutrients um, into the, the lower layer of the soil. And the area is uh, heavily farmed and uh, flood irrigation is a very common practice in this area. For that reason, there is a huge potential for leaching the fertilizers down in the aquifers and, and the soil, lower soil horizons. And, and what trying to do, so this information and all of this network of a probe sending information to back to, to, to the um, funding agency and, and, and they need to provide the report. And um, so it's, they're getting uh, monitored on, on that side. So again, I can't speculate anymore because again, um, so there are confidentiality involved. So I can't really go into the details of that too much, but that's one of the environmental monitoring application that with a shorter probes, not like a, three, four, five, 10, 20 meters, but you know, up to 120 meters, 120 centimeters has been used in, in this case for uh, surface water, as well as the leaching uh, possibilities in a certain catchment areas that feeding into the Great Barrier Reef um, a region. Uh, we can those, move on to- um, You mentioned nutrients, but the actual measure that's coming out of the tri-scan has a quasi indicator of nutrients. What what is that measurement? The measurement is not uh, an any specific ion specific uh, uh, readings, uh, Richard. So they are um, like the, the the way that sensor works. It doesn't pick up. The, the the fertilizer or the nutrient in the actual soil. So if it's just a dry soil, it doesn't show anything if you put it next to the probe or put it in probe next to the soil, if it's absolutely dry, dry as bone. But as long as there is a moisture in the soil, so the moisture content is, is fairly enough for plant to uptake the nutrients, then the, the there are uh, um, diluted nutrients in the soil and, and that's the range of them. So this is not like, like a specifically nitrogen or a phosphorus or a molybdenum or, or a certain uh, chemicals, but it's uh, rather it is um, accumulation of all of the readily available nutrient in the soil water content that can be picked up by the sensors. And normally the, that the way they are calibrated is the way that if it's if, if, if the sensors are picking up, that means that they can be readily up to, uh, uh, taken by the roots of the crop. So the, in this case, um, especially in, in the, in the tri-scan or the, the, the VIC sensor, so they are calibrated that if it picked up by the, soil, uh, by, by the crops, then we will measure it. So for that reason, it's not specifically calibrated to the environmental monitoring projects, but it can be, again, as long as you have a number of the, the soil water samples, and then do the lab test and then start compare, comparing the, the data and then recalibrate it to the project's needs. But it is, is it a measure of conductivity or a measure? Yes, of yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So you can we, we call it VIC or volumetric ionic content, but oh, at the, the same at, is the one. But at, but at the software level, no, no, that's not exactly the same because scientifically we can't call VIC as an EC. Uh, so again, so there should be a, like a conversion that applied to that specific VIC which is depending on the soil top. And we have done extensive tests on and, and, and the calibrations on a different soil tops. So to convert VIC into an EC with a scientific grade readings, and that's also available on the Eremax. So that probably that would be one of the functions that I probably should have mentioned earlier on. So for, for this purpose, so depending uh, whatever soil top uh, um, that projects um, um, has on that specific sites, then, um, um, based on the, the texture of the soil, then you can go to the back end of the Eremax to that database and then calibrate it to that specific soil top. So the, the VIC would be completely related to that specific soil top. Then you can call it EC. 
And um, I believe there are other um, soil uh, data monitoring probes uh, out in the market. And some of them do claim uh, that they, they, they measure EC, but uh, I really would like to see that the, how it's been calculated at the back end and how scientific the, the grades of those uh, readings are. But at, as a general, general rule, I would say regardless of what type of a probe uh, or a soil data monitoring probes are using, again, um, there need to be some sort of a, like a recalibration, especially with the water sample from, from the site. So to make those readings a bit more relevant to the site and to the soil types. Um, I'd just like to make a comment that this is one of the really good applications of these probes is anywhere where you're applying water and nutrients or water and chemicals it's really helpful to have time series data to optimize those application rates so we've been using these in optimizing irrigation rates for wastewater uh, for wastewater disposal purposes and you can see how far the the water is infiltrating down is it going past the root zone and you can also get an indication of what the chemical load is in that. So really useful for that sort of application. We better move on though, running out of time. Um, case number three, um, Melbourne Botanic Garden. Uh, so there were a number of the significant trees uh, on, on, on the Melbourne Botanic Garden. And uh, this project, I think, goes back to good uh, 12 years ago or 15 years ago. So when um, that was, uh, well, when they approached us and said, well, now we have this situation. Um, so the, the significant tree, specifically, I think it's a sequoia tree, was under some uh, um, pressure and showing declining uh, symbol and symptoms that they're not regenerating and looks like they're not coping well with the situation. So, but again, they needed to know, to know what exactly going on down below the surface. Um, in, in the root active zones and, and below the active root zone. So to see that if there is any changes of, of the um, soil water content as well as soil nutrient content, so that causing that issue. Um, to do that and without uh, being too invasive, so um, they, they deployed a number of different probes, uh, the different types of the probes for uh, various uh, locations within the uh, Botanic Garden. One of them, I think, like as you can see on the left-hand side, so it was a four-meter probe that was installed on under that one specific uh, significant tree that showing uh, declination. Now, a um, number of the years uh, that project uh, was run and, and the data was collected and based on the data that was coming up, then they will adjust the irrigation scheduling. And also um, there was um, a grant that I believe uh, Botanic Garden, uh, Melbourne Botanic Garden and zoos uh, received for a water treatment and, and the recycling water so, so they can reapply and then minimizes their water use. Um, and to also support the, the the fundings as well as to show that you know how um, how precisely and accurately they are um, uh, recovering and recycling the water and then reusing it for um, um, rejuvenation of the botanic garden and, and the plants in there. Um, so they had to uh, come up with um, um, a quite extensive logs and uh, reports and, and what, how uh, the, the plants are, are drinking and how they, they're taking nutrients and uh, how they're performing um, above the uh, above the soil surface as well as below the soil surface. So um, the information, um, all um, it's, uh, this is actually one of your uh, clients, um, um, uh, Richard. And Ruben, uh, so running in uh, in in the zoo, they're very very happy uh, with the way uh, they um, they are uh, receiving data, and they are a very good good champions uh, within the system that they're looking into the data and uh, so the some of the work that those uh, um, uh, champions in in the botanic garden so they're doing I, I really take my hat off for them. And the, the level of the, the, the technicality and the, the, the insight they get in the, about the trees at just the next level. So it shows that where exactly the, the trees are drinking, how how hard they're pushing to get the water from lower and lower layers when they're under stress, how much water they, they um, use, they're losing through evapotranspiration on a daily basis. You can even like a, um, go to every minute if you need to, in terms of getting the, the, the daily consumption, uh, sorry, hourly consumption or a, or a, 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 a of the water and nutrient from the crops from those depths and and then of course adjust the irrigation and fertigation system so just not to over irrigate not to under irrigate but just do enough and put it exactly where it's there where, where the active roots so uh, active roots are so to protect 
that tree and just to give it enough to survive and and uh, and flourish rather than decline. Um, so that was a very feel good story and and the good results uh, from from that uh, specific project is still running and uh, we have a very good relationship um, with with the botanic garden and the zoos in in Victoria and a number of the other um, botanic gardens and zoos in Australia as well. Um, so in this case, as on the bottom right corner, you can see, so we, the, the Solio sampler has been used in that project. Uh, a Bluetooth, now there are a number of the Bluetooth probes in that site. There are a number of the compact uh, um, uh, loggers, as well as the 120 centimeter probes are used in the, that area, as well as a long four meter uh, probe that is um, uh, logging the data from, uh, from that significant tree. Just to add to that. So we already um, also installed set flow sensors and dendrometers to measure the directly the uh, water use by the trees. And the uh, zoo then split the uh, split the zoo garden up into various what they call hydro zones, and for each of those, uh, progressively looked at the water use based on the different types of plants that were in there because they've got over 500 different control points on their irrigation system there. we better move on to the next slide, though, Mehdi. Yep. Right, Joe. Now, next one, um, Richard uh, will be, that's the one that you will be talking more about this one, but the uh, overall picture in, in this case. So down the bottom, I'll just explain uh, what they are. So there are different type of uh, satellite imageries as we touched base on it earlier on. I said that you know, we will be... Uh, um, I'm, I'm uh, touching base again on, on that note. So here it is. So um, and as you can see down the bottom, MSAVI, the very first one on the left, and then NDMI, NDVI, NDRE, and, and RECI again. So then the different ways or layers of, of looking at the data from, from the sky. So what you can see, it is like an actual overall site, which is a quite extensive and big site. Um, and then and, 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 and different locations within the sites, the, the Maloon Institute installed uh, a number of different soil data monitoring uh, probes and, and they and what the guy did the work that they're doing and the, the, the level of the technicalities that are going uh, into these projects. Uh, again, um, again, I take my hat off. There are uh, very good work is being done and they're receiving very good result in terms of rehydrating the landscape and sustainable production of the, the food production and regenerative farmers, farming, as well as the healthier ecosystem for not only for us, but again, for the next uh, generations. But again, so on this cap, because before I move on and pass on to you, Richard, so that would be, if you can actually quickly move on to the next slide, which where we kept those um, um, uh, and satellite images here. Got right. So, so again, as you can see, normalized deviation of the moisture. So you can check the the moisture level at, at the different uh, times of the year. Uh, and then let's say you can pick one or two or three of them um, at the, at the software level, or you can extract it and then put it next uh, side by side to compare it. But it gives you a good overview over the time. So, how was the moisture level look like in let's say in the past six months, past past one year, past two years, or ten years, depending how long you've been running the database. So. Again, second one, a deviation of the red edge index. So again, in that case, now you can say, uh, again, so that red edge in index is based on the red edge chlorophyll. So the picks on, on the different types of vegetation, different re re uh, respond to the, the infrared uh, um, 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 readings that come from the satellites, and then also picks on, on the different types of vegetation. Let's say you are growing, okay, it's, it's in the farming situation, you got uh, three different crops growing, and or maybe you got a, a main crop and then the cover crop, just to cover the the, 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 the land for a, for a moisture retention. Then in that case, again, if you're only using NDVI, which is like a mainstream that's every um, one, when they're talking about the satellite, maybe people like just think, okay, so there's only one. But no, there's actually, there are different ones, different ways of looking at the data from different angles and filters. And then they give you different views and different informations. So in this case, uh, red edge chlorophyll, uh, red edge index, again, it picks on, let's say you have three tops, so you can, so I can mi minimize it down to those three tops and then pick up where exactly they are, how they're doing in terms of their health, in terms of regeneration or, or declining, and then so on. Next one, uh, vegetation index, NDVI, ge generic one that's most of the, um, the, the, the uh, in, in terms of food production and agriculture that has been used quite extensively. My uh, favorite one uh, is actually the, the very last one. So red edge chlorophyll index. So again, so again, especially in the, in the, 
uh, the two crops situation or cover crop situation. And the, I, I find it very useful, as well as the, the one before the last one, MSAVI, which is the, the minimized soil adjusted vegetation index, which used mainly at the early stage of, of the cropping or in, in the situation that you have more exposure to the bare soil. So you might have a bit of a germination of the crops or, or a regeneration of a certain, let's say, um, a native crops or a native uh, vegetation. But majority of the area that you're surveying or monitoring are, are bare soil, then that can be interrupt with, with the reading. So in that case, it's better to use a different lens, different layer called MSAVI to, to work on those uh, uh, um, 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 data um, uh, sets. So again, back to the previous slide, Richard, and back to you, if you want to speculate more on that. Sure, just briefly. So this, this is a good example of why you need both Capacitance probe, continuous data, and the satellite imagery. On the left-hand slide, you'll see there's a stream that's running through it, and these there's a series of leaky weirs that are installed along this. So the question is, do these leaky weirs lead to increased soil moisture in the adjacent floodplains and, and therefore increased um, agricultural productivity. So if you, if from the continuous probes, the capacitance probes, you can sort of get a feel for how much moisture is coming up from below as capillary rise and how much is coming down as infiltration from rainfall. And then from the satellite data, you can look at the distribution of moisture out from the, the creek and look at is there a... Is there a pattern that's emerging? Um, I would like to thank Centec for providing a donation in kind for this imagery for, for the Maloon Institute's project. Um, last comment on satellite imagery is there's a whole range of satellite imagery we're using on this project, and some of it goes all the way back to the 1970s. So wow. in sort of landscape work, it's... Um, sometimes the best data you have to look at are you really creating change um, on the ground. So just keep that in mind if you're doing this sort of work. It's been really valuable. Um, better move on to Ruben is going to talk about phytocaps and um, how it's being used in, in the phytocaps for landfills. Cheers. Thanks, Richard. Um, Realise we're running a bit over time, so I'll keep it relatively brief. Um, so this application is a bit of a more unique one. So um, the, just a bit of context, uh, it was a phyto cap. Um, and what a phyto cap is, for those that don't know, is just a um, less conventional landfill cap that utilizes vegetation on the cap to regulate um, soil moisture instead of a conventional GM membrane cap. Um, so on this site, there were nine Enviroscan um, probes um, inserted across the cap. Um, these were the all-in-one units, so the units that have um, a modem with a SIM, and they're constantly um, sending data to Iramax um, and updating live. Um, and there were further two installed in the live simulator on site as well. So the main goal of these soil moisture probes in the cap is to observe and monitor trends in soil moisture um, over time, especially while the vegetation was establishing, um, to monitor uh, the effective root zone. So as a vegetation is establishing, how um, deep the root zone is going and where the vegetation is drawing moisture from. Um, and with the capabilities of Iramax Live, and the probes were able to set up uh, trigger levels and you know, saturation points um, to determine when um, plants were in a state of stress or the cap was having um, full saturation and there's a free draining event. Um, so in a landfill situation, the free draining event um, past those um, past those virus scans. Uh, can be potential leachate generation in the cap. So it's very important to monitor um, and be aware of when there are those infiltration events. 
but going forward, it helps to understand where the plants drawing moisture from and just overall trends in soil moisture across the landfill cap. Um, and these are working in conjunction with the lysimeters on the site, which also had the soil moisture probes in them. Um, and these soil, uh, lysimeters were capturing um, absolute data in terms of um, subsurface runoff and surface runoff. Uh, back to you, Mehdi. All right, next case of study, uh, so surface water management uh, and flood prevention. Uh, it's a quite hot topics um, at the moment, uh, especially in Australia and in some other countries that have this issue. Um, what you can see here, again, on the top uh, left corner, so then that's the part of the Victoria uh, that uh, there we had some sort of a, like a flood last year specifically, which was quite uh, devastating. And uh, at the same time, they had fire too. So that was interesting and uh, unfortunate to hear that. But anyway, cut along long story short, that area is uh, in, in, in the high rainfall area. So of course, you know, they would be having uh, sometimes in, during the year or during a, a num number of years or whatever the gap is, there would be a possibility for a flood and runoff, uh, water runoff uh, off the surface. Um, so what they uh, decided to do, um, again, and, and to manage also the, the the running of water as well as in use it for a for rehydration of of the ecosystem and the soil horizons um so what they do um they they put a number of the probes in in a number of different uh, strategic locations and areas where they operating uh, I believe, um, again, I can't be too specific, but there are some crown land and also some leased land from, from the private uh, entities that uh, they are pumping the, the surface, surface water into the overhead irrigation um, um, uh, pipes and, and irrigation um, the pivots. Um, so to pump it, pump the surface water into certain areas to get them just to, to the saturation point. The reason for that is that, first of all, so rather than letting the, the, the um, um, water, um, which is quite valuable, uh, just to run off and then go to the ocean, so they might put it back into the aquifers and rehydrate the ecosystem, as well as the way that they're using it's mainly um, in the areas that there is a fair bit of a pasture um, and, and the animal grazing going on, and they use that water to like to um, um, uh, irrigate it pretty much to maximize the, the, the feed production for animals. And so that's double purpose. And at the same time, again, they, they monitoring the, the moisture level in the soil. So the way they're doing it, so again, so it's, it's a very fine tune, driving it to the, the threshold, but not over. So make sure that it, it doesn't get to the to the point that if there is a rain or a, or a water, a um, uh, big rain or a big water um, intrusion into the soil event, then it doesn't cause a runoff. So they, on the, on the, on the bottom right corner, you see a graph from one of those uh, uh, probes um, that has been used in the area. As you can see, I'm um, right in in the 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 red circle on on the left hand side. So you see on the orange sensor and the green sensor, which is somewhere close to about I would say 60, 70 centimeters, or not sorry, 40 and 50 centimeters, and also the one blue. So they're almost showing flat lining. So and that's what they're aiming for. So that's the sweet spot. So again, as soon as you know, they get to the flat uh, um, flat lining, it means that that's the saturation point. So no matter how much more volume of the water goes into the system, it doesn't increase the, the value or the numbers of that specific soil horizon or type and it just would be free flowing of the water going down so again you can push it like a lower layers maybe 50 like this this specific sites and, and projects they're mainly using 90 centimeter and 120 centimeter uh, probes um and uh, on different sites and what they're really interested in the top 20 to top 30 centimeters of the soil so what they're trying to avoid as much as possible is just to avoid the saturation or full saturation of those top 10, 20, 30 centimeters of the soil as much as possible, but try to push it with the, the fair bit of infiltration and in that soil. And then over the time, they work it out how much volume of the water I need to supply to this irrigation pivot control. So to get the water to, let's say, 30, 40, 50, 60 centimeters without saturating the land and without causing any leaching also happened in, on that site. So the aim is 
to keep the top 10, 20, 30 centimeters um, uh, close to the saturation, but not too close. So again, that can prevent the flood. And at the same time, they're still increasing the feed for animals and rehydrating the aquifers in that area. Um, probes that has been used, uh, or the data probes that have been used in, that probes, uh, in these uh, projects, uh, they're mainly plus systems. So the one that you can see on the top right corner, so the old plus units. And again, so there's a new generation of, of the plus, which we quickly covered up on the new products uh, on the earlier slide, which we call it IoT, which is does exactly the same thing at the plus, but in this case, then it's connected to a, um, a rechargeable battery, a lithium rechargeable battery can go for a good five, six years. Um, you can uh, set the readings as low as every two minutes if you want uh, to read from the soil. But normally these guys are doing exactly the same as every half an hour to read uh, data from the soil and then upload into the Aramax. And then from then onward, they will uh, analyze data and then make their decision. Uh, been a quite successful uh, project and uh, I don't think that would be stopping anytime soon. So they using these products for that specific application in the environment and that's been quite successful and other other environmental monitoring applications so we're getting closer to the end of the, the slides but again so some of the case studies we covered up um, in, in this case because of the the limitation of the time and we already over the time as well so but very quickly again so that's been a number of different projects uh, across the globe that uh, they have used the soil data probes uh, for uh, for a monitoring and for environmental applications. Um, so again, let's say um, on, on the, from, from the left side, again, you see that it's in Australia, Canada, France, and USA, as far as we are concerned, and we've been told. So they have been using the, the long probes, 10, 20, 30, uh, meters of, of the EnviroScan uh, deep installed for, for a land side rehabilitation or mine side rehabilitation. Groundwater monitoring, again, uh, USA, Australia, Spain, France, that's the, the project that we were um, quite heavily involved actually um, in terms of uh, how they can use the, 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 the products and, and uh, to some extent what our uh, um, US um, business uh, development uh, um, um, colleague. So he was quite involved in, in this specific project in in the us and lots of good project uh, good data came out of it um other ones uh, flood forecast uh, as you can see um so as, as we spoke um, earlier on um so and, and the, the getting to the saturation point or close to the saturation point uh pros being used in a certain different areas uh, again you can see the countries as as is written there uh, and i'm sure there are more but we might not know about it because again we are a supplier it goes through the distributor and the distributors have a relationship with their end user and and the, the government agencies or or the projects coordinator so we won't know uh, all of the, the applications that is applied but these ones that we know so like normally for the flood pre prevention and flood monitoring and the forecast they use it along the the river beds or along the catchment areas let's say the Moulin uh, Institute site which would be a good example of that one I'm not sure to what extent they're using it for a flood prevention but that concept is is been very actively used for a flood monitoring uh, um, application and using soil data probes, they don't really need to go too deep. So they mainly would be interested in the top 30, 40, 50 centimeters of the soil, depending how deep is, is the soil horizon in that area. Let's say in like in a couple of projects that at the moment we are running in the Australia. So they are only interested in the top 30, but they go a little bit further. So to have a bit of an insight about the lower layers as well. Um, but um, anything around uh, 60 centimeter or shorter probes can do the job as good as anything uh, for this specific flood monitoring and flood forecast purposes. Um, carbon farming, uh, this is becoming a quite big one uh, in, in the... This, this has been a good one, a big one in, in the Canada and US. Slightly, slightly, we're hearing bits and pieces here and there in Australia too. And uh, um, um, th there is a fair bit, a bit of an application on the, the carbon farming and then working out what the active root zones are and then how much uh, um, 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 uh, organic matters through that roots are actually growing in a certain area. Then they, they estimate the growth under the ground and then based on that, so also they have a root canopy above and then they, they're capturing that sort of like a carbon content 
proteins in that organic matter as well. And then there are formulations you know, that they, they apply to. We don't know exactly what's happening, but we know that you know, that has been used quite extensively in uh, in US and Canada for a carbon farming. And some of the interesting like a hard work jobs, like and so the archaeological sites, um, especially in Turkey and in Egypt, a uh, number of the probes, uh, some of them not too far and not too long, maybe about 60 to 80, 80 60 to 90 centimeter probes has been used in, in the Turkey sites. And in Egypt, I believe they're slightly longer to monitor the, the water content of the soil in, in a certain depths and uh, for a deterioration of those sites and some other aspects that they are considering to, to maintain the integrity of the site uh, without getting to, uh, without turning it into a ruin. Um, there are other applications, but again, the, the slides and times are, are limited, so we need to stick to the time as well. Um, so I reckon next one. Oh, yeah. So um, before I say, um, before I pass on back to the Hydroterra team, so just a quick brief on, on the integration of the data. So the data from, from the probe or from different uh, sensors uh, you might have come to the different display units. These days, um, integration of all of the display units together and having all of the data in one dashboard is quite important for end users. And and uh, for easiness of the access to the data and then do their analysis and, and the decisions. So um, software, uh, our software is compatible with pretty much most of the other display platforms. So um, so they can um, link up at the back end and, and, send, uh, and, and send API data, all the data uh, from, from our end to theirs or from theirs to ours. Um, as long as the owner of the, the, the equipments and the data or the account manager are happy to not to do that. So on that note, the, the equipments are like what, the, what we manufacture is it like we manufacture and then we sell it off. So again, so there's a one off sale. Once you own it, that's yours. And whatever information coming from those probes um, and, and those equipments that also will be um, the ownership of those data would be the ownership that belongs to the owner of the probes and and or the the their account manager that's running after uh, running their their um, accounts and uh, looking after them. In this case, Hydroterra, for example. So in that case, if a client would like to integrate with other uh, other uh, platforms and we need to take information, export the information out of the Eremax or into the Eremax for whatever reason analysis. Again, so that is a possibility and uh, we have we don't discriminate so we are open to that sort of uh, discussions um, again we need to have it in writing because of, of the um, data security and and the iso certificates that you know we need to keep up and we get audited quite extensively on the data security and they're quite big for for the it purpose um so the ownership of the data is is yours not ours we pro provide the platform and also the platform has got a three backups um so we'll you will never lose your data so we have a physical the uh, um, backups as well as the cloud based backups in in the various locations in the world as well as in the cloud in amazon and so there is like an almost absolute guarantee that you will never lose the data. Even you delete completely your database, we still can recover it just in case if you need to. Once you have an account, you have an account for life. But again, if you haven't logged in for a year, so you need to let the account manager, in this case, for example, Hydroterra know, so to just to let you in again. But as long as you are logged in once every 12 months, then you won't be locked in and that account is exist and you can have access to it for as long and as many times as you want. So uh, here on that note, I'll uh, um, I pass on to the Hydroterra team and I uh, thanks and appreciate uh, your attention, your time and your um, 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 interest in, in, in the ACTEC and, and the soil data monitoring and these projects. Well, thanks very much, Mehdi. That was fantastic and very comprehensive. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I think you might have covered it all, Mehdi. Um, all right, that's good. I thought it was um, really good. Interesting application with the uh, soil carbon side of things and how they're doing that. I'm I'm doing it in mine as well, but again at the limited capacity at this stage to work out the numbers, see if it's uh, financially viable to to expand it. But at this stage, it's just more my uh, citizen test, I suppose. It's good. Someone's got to do it. Um, mm. So thanks very much, very much everyone who's joined us today. It was great to have you along to our Hydroterra Tech Talk, and many thanks to Ruben 
and Jane at the Hydra Terra End uh, who have coordinated putting this together. And a big thank you to yourself, Medi from Centec, for providing your time and expertise. Really appreciate it. Um, one day, a final comment, if I may make, uh, Richard, um, in terms of the equipment and, and handling the equipment and interpretation of the data. So one thing that I need to be clear, um, so the equipments are easy to use, but against so the data that's coming out, it actually needs to be handled and treated with the care and and. Uh, uh, with what with uh, technical expertise um so again it's at, at like a food production and the farming and agriculture um so having a look at the, the data it after a while it give you like a good insight in terms of how you can more um, uh, um adjust the irrigation fertigation and the farm management but again again once we're coming to the bigger bigger project so it's more technicality involved definitely that needs to be handled by uh proper technicians people know their trade and people know the equipments and the readings and then um, how to handle the products and interpret the data for the clients so there could be a huge um, um, issue if, if it's not handled by a proper technicians and in that case again hydroterra being um and hydroterra team um been a great uh, team to work with uh, very professional uh, technicians and again um, i really take my hat off for some of the work that you guys are doing um, with our equipment so you're actually making us champion and <laughs> what's meant to be the other way around so thank you um for all of your great work uh, on the ground as well as your uh, very professional technicians Thanks very much, Maddie. I appreciate the plug, that's for sure. <laughs> no, You're really welcome. Do. And um, thank you very much. We'll leave it there. No worries. Thanks. All right. Have a great day. You too.